Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode seven of uh, the Teddy and JD podcast. Got my man Teddy with me today. And uh, we got a special guest, uh, Matt Matthew Auten, a good friend of mine, uh, also a former teammate, but now, now a coach. Oh, yeah, before we get started, so what's going on with you, Teddy? Not much, man. Just sitting around with the fam on Father's Day, spending time. Been working out a lot still, trying to stay in shape since I've been back home. It's pretty much the same story, different day, you know, working, trying to figure out what my next move after basketball, getting back in school, trying to finish that up too. So a lot of little things like that going on, but that's about it. Right, right, right. So uh, you back in Louisiana, ain't you? Yeah, I'm back in Louisiana now. I've been here for about a week. I stayed in Atlanta when I got back. I was in Atlanta for like about 10 days till quarantine period was over. Then from Atlanta, I came home. Been home for about a week now, just taking care of little things to father my career and my, making my next move in life, you know, okay. life after basketball. That's what you got to do, man. Before we get started, I got to give a shout out to my man, Herme Duran uh, from Pro Basketball or Advanced Pro Basketball out of Amsterdam. Gave me, uh, helped me out with some video stuff. Y'all ever need any help with your videos, holler at him. He got all the advanced statistics and uh, all that good stuff. So now we get that out the way. Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself to our to 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 our listeners. Like I said, you you coaching now, um, but like we played in Donar uh, together in 2010. That's where we first met. So uh, go ahead, go go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Otten. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, from uh, let's say I'm a military brat. So I grew up, you know, growing up, moving around base to base. Um, and played a little college ball in San Francisco State Division II. Um, uh, and then uh, I embarked on a professional career in Europe. I played uh, Switzerland, England, and Groningen. That's where I played with, with Jason, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, I, let's say I retired at 34 about four years ago and getting old. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I got into coaching. You know, it's it's funny hearing Teddy talking about stopping and figuring out what's next. Uh, it's, it's, I, I've been there, and uh, a, yeah. lot of, a lot of players going through that. Uh, and that's 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 a hard step to make. You know, when when basketball is all. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's me. Um, played. Uh, Played, played, played while I could, and and then I got into coaching, and now I'm trying to. Uh, uh, I fell in love with coaching, so that's uh, the next step for me. For a little bit of context, when we played together, it was my first year in Groningen, and we were on the same plane flying over. We didn't know who each other were or who 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 uh, we were, or whatever. So. We all got, we both got in Hans's car. And it was like, oh, I seen you on the plane, blah, blah, blah. So we got on the way. <laughs> Are y'all serious? <laughs> yeah. So we got to talking on the way to Groningen. Uh, uh, and then to come to find out, he lived uh, right below me. So we was like, so my apartment was on the top floor. His was on the middle floor. So that year, him and I became like, best friends like we did a lot a lot of stuff together you know what i mean like, yeah. or argued about kobe and uh lebron for a two lot. years yeah this was back that, that's Friday that's, that's an year. ongoing pro <laughs> that's an ongoing thing with him too <laughs> yeah. him and yeah. lebron like best buddies hey man i just respect the well, greatness. That's J all. jason I, I don't know if you know this uh even teddy i don't know if you know this but uh when i first came from college i had a tryout with amsterdam and Teddy was on that roster. Um, so I was there for about a week uh, trying to make your roster. Uh, maybe I was, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no, nowhere near the level Teddy was, you know, Teddy, Teddy was already on contract. So I was trying to make the team. Um, yeah. So I worked out with Teddy for a week and then I went to Cyprus uh, that week. Uh, so that was, uh, I already knew Teddy a little bit. And I, yeah, hell of a I don't even remember that. that was <laughs> Ooh, yeah, what year was that? What year was that? That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Oh, 2007. Wow. 2007. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shevek was coach. Um, and I I was an American. I didn't have my Dutch citizenship yet. Um, that also helped me in my career. Um, so, you know, I, I remember Shevek saying, you know, as, as, a, as a Dutch player, maybe we take you. As American, 
we have enough. So it was, uh, but it was, uh, it was nice. Uh, I got to work out with, uh, with Teddy and see what, see the gift that, that he has. And, you know, from then on, like I said, you, you probably don't even remember me, but I followed your career after that. And it's funny to see that you, you came back and played with Jason, yeah. you know, who I got to play with. That was uh, pretty amazing to see. Small world, ain't it? Small world. Yeah, it is a small world. It is a small world. I don't got the best memory in the world either. So <laughs> don't hold me, you know, don't I hold wasn't me. that memorable. I, that me. <laughs> I wasn't that memorable. It's all right. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, uh, Speaking of, you said you went to Cyprus from that. Tell us a little bit about your career, uh, Matt. Like, because you told me about it uh, multiple times, like, you know, the just different things that you had to overcome to get to the point where you had, like, a what, a 10-year career overseas? Or, is that right? I, I had a 10-year career, yeah. 10-year uh, career, which, which a lot of people, you know, they dream of that, but they never have a career that long. Yeah. Can you can you kind of tell us a few of the things that you went through, like how it first started, your first job, et cetera, et cetera? Well, first of all, um, coming from a Division Two is difficult enough. You know, uh, yeah. it's uh, uh, there's there's thousands of Division One players who are already um, you know first take when, when coaches are scouting or clubs are scouting. So um, I, I believe that I was a part. I, I, I'm a little bit older now, but uh, when YouTube started coming out and you can upload your videos I think I was there at that time so you know I put all my video online I started networking with agents and coaches and I found out I can get my Dutch citizenship so that was that made it um made me more of a higher commodity as a division yeah. two player but sure. with Dutch yeah. citizenship um uh, so that uh you know that kind of sparked my my career being able to get that it took me some time to get it um, so my first job in Cyprus was as an American. My first job in England was as an American. And then I acquired Dutch citizenship um, and then uh, you know, was able to go from there. And on top of that, you know, I, I already had two knee surgeries in college, but uh, it was just one of those things. I was like, I'm going to do this and I'm, I'm not stopping until I do it. You know? and, uh, right. and, then, and then, of course, I got, to, I got to play with great players like Teddy and win a championship with Jason. So, yeah, it was uh, – I had I had what I call a grinder career, but uh, I I was there and I'm and I was proud to be there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think um, between the three of us, that's pretty much how we all got started. It's kind of like it was a grind for me starting out too. You had to start at a lower level and then build up from there. Even though I went to a major D one, I just I didn't really. You know, when we came out of school, well, when I came out of school, it was okay, I'm 40, but when I came out of school, they were in the league, you know, they were only taking guys who had been, at that time, they were taking guys who stayed in college two or three years and had numbers too. So you had to be experienced at that time. It wasn't just about athleticism and potential back then. You know, it right. kind of shifted, like the draft kind of shifts like that. Right. So back then, it wasn't like being athletic. You know, now if you're athletic, you can run and you can jump. If you can do that extremely well, it gives you a, a great shot at getting drafted or even making it overseas. Where nowadays, I mean, where back then, that wasn't – you needed more. That that wasn't the only criteria that applied. So making it to the NBA was a little tougher at that time. Just because, like I said, it, it changes with, you know, personnel. Like now people want point guards that can shoot the ball or – at first, you know, and then years later, they might want peer point guards who run teams. So it kind of shifts. So when I came out, they weren't just looking for athletic, you know, guys. Because if that was the case, I probably would have made it easy. It was just, you know, so I had to grind like you, coming to Amsterdam, playing for only eight hundred dollars a month, and working my way up to really? that point. Yeah, my first season, wow. eight hundred dollars a month. That was it at Amsterdam. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. You, you rode that train when they started. They had big money after a while, but yeah, he was there in the beginning. So that's cool. No, I wasn't there in the beginning. It was just like I didn't play my first season out. I was young, and they knew that I needed to get my foot in the door. So they used that as an advantage. So I didn't have no weight to be like I don't. I I couldn't turn it down. It was the only job off I had. Right. So and to me, to be honest. It was just my dream to play professional, so I still thought I was winning from that angle at that time. I was like, I'm playing professional basketball. I'm getting paid to do it. Right. So I and didn't even look at it as like a downside. I feel like that mindset is what was able to carry you 
to a Euro League job because you touched Euro League. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that that's 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 an amazing story. Very similar to Mass though, like how uh like you said, coming out of a D2. But what I find interesting is is you took Matt, you took it upon yourself and before YouTube and putting film on online was a thing, you was doing that. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think I think like uh the moral of that story or what I take from that is is like like you said, I'm gonna do this, and you didn't let yeah. you didn't let nothing really really stop you in that regard, and you did everything that you could that was in your control, and I feel like that's something that a lot of people, you know, they say they want to do something, but then they don't take these necessary steps to do it. So that's uh that's what's up, man. So Mo, what's the best memory you had as a player? Like what's the what's the what's the Best moment, best best uh, season, whatever. Could be a season, could be a moment, could be in your 10 years. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously winning a championship uh, in that 2009-2010 season uh, at, at Donar. Um, you know, seeing I, – I take a lot of what I learned at, in that season to, with me coaching. You know, that's the, the kind of togetherness that we had and, uh, you know, I talked to Marco about this a couple of weeks ago, how I wasn't accepting my ro role at first because I wanted to play, you know, but here we, here we are in the top, you know, contending team in the Netherlands. Uh, but after I accepted my role and, and, you know, everybody bought into what we were doing, that was one of the greatest experiences that I had in my career, you know, being, being a part of that greatness that we achieved, that we reached, um, that togetherness, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that was that was special for me you know I, I've had some good years where I, statistically also um, but I think that year my I was I was a role player I was in the guard give Bowser rest uh, but that was still my favorite year because you know the, the camaraderie of our team because it, it, it's just something that I took with me after my career and I always reflect back on uh, when I'm trying to teach you know trying to reach that kind of uh, togetherness so definitely 2009 2010 season right to, to, to touch on that like because we've talked about that team on this show before and i tell people all the time that was one of the most uh cohesive together units from top to bottom that i've ever been a part of and you mix that with the talent like like you know Teddy and i have talked about it before he's played on teams similar to that too obviously throughout his career but that truly was a special year. And it was like, I remember it was from day one, how it clicked. I don't know how, if you felt the same way, but I felt like the, from the, from the first practice, you could see, you could kind of feel it. And then the connection that we made with uh, the fans of, of, of Donar, I also thought was special. And you mentioned Marco, Marco was the coach, Marco Vandenberg. Uh, you mentioned like guys like Matt Bowsher, Tim Blue, uh, we had Jason Ellis, uh, Steve Ross, Robbie Bostain. Everybody was, you know, really, really connected on that squad. And I, that's something that you just really don't see a lot in professional basketball. So I, I got to agree with you. That was a real special, special, uh, special season with a lot of special moments involved. So that's pretty cool. You said that, that that was, uh, that was your, that was your best, the best moment. You know? Hands down. Hands down. I learned a lot from, you know, my teammates, from coach, you know, uh, it's, uh, it was uh, the experience that I always reflect on and I talk about to my players uh, now, you know, so that's uh, being a part of that was one of my greatest achievements as a player. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. Yeah, when did, when did you, um, like, when you finished, when you got done with your professional career, at what point did you decide that you want to be a coach? Uh, I think right away, I was playing in Rotterdam on my third year of playing for Rotterdam. And during that season, I started coaching a under under 21 team. They started a new league called the Dutch Talent League. And uh, I asked them if I can coach it and, and they and they agreed. And, and I think I, I kind of knew I, I wanted to coach um, because, you know, as a grinder, I feel like I, I, I put in more time in the game, uh, you know, and I can teach that. Uh, players how to get the best out of themselves and to, to go yeah. for it if you want it. Uh, so I knew that, but after that year coaching, then I, then that kind of solidified that this is what I'm going to do. Um, Cause you know, 
being able to get something out of a player uh, is, is special to me as well. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, yeah, my last year playing and coaching at the same time. That was that yeah. was the, so it was a, it was a it was an easy transition for me to stop um, because I instantly fell in love with coaching. Um, yeah, that year. Yeah, but, but for sure, the, the year before, when you know, when the body starts breaking apart, I, you know, you say, "What? What's next?" You got to start thinking about that. That's that's kind of scary. Uh, so I got I got lucky that I that I, that I clicked with coaching uh, right away. And now I'm still lucky to to be able to work off of uh, coaching and, and do it full time. What, what was your? Yeah, yeah. Oh my, my bad. Go ahead, Teddy. No, I was gonna say it's when you can the faster you can figure it out you know, your next, you know, I mean, I think when you play as long as we have, especially, you know, you play 10 years, but me and Jason been 15 years or better, the faster you can figure out what your next passion is, the better it is. It makes it a little easier transition. So, you know, it was good that you were able to figure it out so fast because I think that kind of simplifies the transition from one career to the next. Absolutely. It, and it's, it, I've talked to a lot of players over the years, and it's never easy. Like, a lot of, you know, some guys transition really well. Some guys take them a minute to find what they want to do. But uh, it's, it's, it's never an easy thing when you play that long or play any sport for that long. It's like, damn, like, what am I going to do next, you know? Like, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I'm still hoping to play next year. But I know, you know, my time is coming up, too. So I'm kind of in the same yeah. boat. But, but uh so Mo, what was your what was your first job? What was it? What was that like? What was the first job? How did, how you know? How was the learning curve? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, like I said, I I, um, I my first tryout was with Amsterdam. Um, so I was there for a week. You know, um, uh, practice. Well, Shavek had had arrived middle of that week. Um, so I was working with the other coach they had there, and then. That week, I found out it was going to take me more time than I thought to get my Dutch citizenship. So I had my agent look around more um, because Amsterdam was maybe ready to sign me if I got my Dutch citizenship, uh, but not as an American. So then I went to Cyprus, and I was in Cyprus. I played for Apollon Limassol, and I was there for about two months before I got released um, because, well, um, I didn't pass the physical, um, but they took, they, they, you know, they, they didn't take the physical until the second month out. Um, and then they wow. compared my knees and they said that my knees were no good to, to finish or to, to, for a full season. Um, because I already had two, two knee surgeries, like I said. Um, mm -hmm. so, so then, uh, I got on the phone with another coach who had been recruiting me uh, from England immediately and was able to get that job. You know, I literally flew from uh, Cyprus, Cyprus to Dream. Amsterdam to England and played for a club called Cheshire Phoenix now. It used to be called Chester Jets. So, yeah, it, that was technically my first job, Chester Jets. And that was a great experience. You know, they, they let me play, um, you know, and it w had some great teammates as well. And I had a good good year that year, which also sparked – uh, an opportunity for me to get my next job in Switzerland and my next job in, in, in Donar, you know, so, uh, uh, yeah. All right. So that was your first playing job. What was your, uh, what was your first coaching job? Like, like the learning curve with that, like the experience, how, how did that go? Um, first coaching job was, was also great. Well, first I coached the, the Dutch talent league while I was playing. So I don't really consider that my first coaching job. <laughs> Um, so after I stopped playing, I I knew Sam Jones from playing against him. I don't, you guys, I think, yeah, you know okay. Sam Jones yeah. Playing against him. And uh, when I was coaching the Dutch Talent League, I would see him in our gym after we played a game, and I I was asking coaches questions, and he he had just recently stopped playing as well, so I was interested in his story. Uh, so I was always talking to him after we played against them as a player. Um, so when I stopped playing, you know after many conversations with him as a player, I called him immediately. I said, you know, I really want to take a step into coaching. You got any for me? And he, and he said, well, you know what? Uh, our assistant coach just stopped. So, you know, let's set up an interview. And, uh, and so we had an interview online just like this. Um, and we talked and, and you know, 
he he saw my passion in coaching and and saw that uh, uh, you know we sort of had a click. So that was my first job. It was called the SPM Shooters. It's now the New Heroes in Denver. Yeah, you know, then boss. Then yeah. boss. <laughs> so so yeah. So I I became the assistant there, and we we were in Europe Cup. Uh, so so for me to I, I I don't know now Rotterdam basketball now is getting bigger, but when I was finishing my career, it was a pretty low level. Um, yeah. Bottom three in the league. Uh, so to go from playing on the bottom three in the league to be an assistant coach in a Europe Cup team, that one. Arvin Slachter, Case Ackerbaum, Stefan Vessels, you know, that yeah. was, wow. It was like, it was, uh, uh, so yeah. And it, that was a great job as well. Sam, Sam first, he was a great mentor because when I came in there, he said, you know what? Just listen for a month. You know, so I was on the court every day with him. Just listen. And then after a month, after you learn what I'm teaching, then you can start, you know, uh, implementing it. Yeah. So, yeah. so after, after that month, you know, then, then I was kind of in Sam's head and I was, you know, we were both kind of uh, working together for the season. And it, it was great to work uh, on that level and coaching Europe Cup. And uh, that, that was a beautiful transition for me, you know, uh, to, to, to be able to coach my first season on that level. So yeah, yeah, that's that was an amazing first year. Yeah, was great that? experience too. Yeah, Matt, was Ty Wesley on that team? No, he was there a year before. So we uh, we had all Dutch and uh, it was well, one Canadian player, De Deon Kravic, um, and we won the cup with an all Dutch and one import. So that was that was overachieving in my opinion. You know, uh, yeah, we yeah. didn't make it out of the semifinals. Uh, of the playoffs, but we won the won the cup by a buzzer beater. So that was that was a fun year. I remember. Yeah. I, watched, I was in Germany that year, and I was watching that game. I remember that. That's right. I forgot Kravitz. Yeah, because uh, that that was the game. Uh, Muhammad Karazi. He he hit a buzzer beater, but it was after the clock. Right? Was that that game? Yes. That was crazy. It was that game. They were they were celebrating. Um, you know, but they, they were. Uh, that was the first time I've ever seen anybody in the Dutch league go to the video, bro. Ever. So it was – that's what I was about to ask. Was it really after the clock? It was. Well, according yeah. to the video, it was. Uh, and and I've always said, you know, to this day – well, not to this day, actually, uh, that fair is fair. Um, but – but I, I work – I got to – I, I've been blessed enough to work with Worthy De Jong and, and Mohamed Karazi. Now I work with the Orange Lions national team. And uh, we had a long talk about it. It was the first time we talked about that situation uh, because I only saw it from our perspective and from Sam and our team. And, and uh, right. Because Zigo Sports was there recording the game. And uh, Zigo Sports uh, had the film set up right behind the table so we could see that the buzzer went off before it left his hand. And um, uh, so so we were telling them, you need to go look so at the video. And I always make fun of Sam to this day because he was doing this, go to the film. <laughs> we're like, yeah. what is this, 1940? Uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so they uh, they went to the film and uh, it took them a long time because I think that was the, the debate uh, was whether or not it's fair. And and I always thought fair was fair, but after hearing and talking with Worthy and Muhammad about it, you know, if we played that game in a regular season, in in Apollo, in any other anywhere gym else, except for, there's except no for video, Jim. There would have been no video. Through. There would have been no light, uh, and and lighting would have been the champion. So yeah. after after hearing it from their perspective, you know, it kind of okay, you know, I can see it uh, both ways. Yeah, um, gives you a different perspective on how to yeah. look at it. Yeah. So, but it was crazy. fun. It was fun to, you know, to, and now I get to work with those guys who, who I always looked up to in my career as well. And uh, it was it was fun to to reflect on that that moment um, and talk about it. Uh, so yes, I remember that game, man. That game was crazy. That was a that was a unbelievable. And then I remember when I was watching online, I said the exact same thing. I was like, they never go to the video. <laughs> never seen it in the Dutch league. <laughs> And that's the type of stuff that goes on in the Dutch league sometimes where you're just like, man, you should be wondering. Well, somebody, yeah, for well. sure. I, I, I agree. And like I said, you know, I, I could I could definitely see from their point of view. But but fair if they would have won it, 
let me ask you this: if they if they would have won it, and you go home and you see it on on TV and it's clearly in your hand, I'm pissed. So you won it, yeah. knowing that it, it the ball wasn't out of your hand. You know how how does that is that? No, you know, I'm with you. I'm with you. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not saying going to the video is wrong. All I'm saying is that they never did that. So I understand yeah. both sides, like, because there was a chip on the line. You know what I mean? So I'm sure, like, you're – I'm glad they got it right because it, you guys rightfully won that game. All I'm saying is I see from their point of view, when I was watching it, I was like, man, they got to be pissed because they never go to the video. Never, ever, yeah. ever have I seen that in Dutch League game. So, yeah, that was, that was one for the books right there. That was definitely one for the books. So – Great, great game. But so tell us what you're doing uh, now, uh, Matt. Like you coach, you say you, you're coaching. Who are you coaching? Like what, what's going on? You're down in Nijmegen, right? Yeah. So I live in Nijmegen, <clears throat> and uh, and I'm working for a club. Uh, well, it's it's the whole region. Um, it's called Basketball Community Helvela, <clears throat> and uh, they're well. They we've been trying to take a step into DBL for some time, um, and I think we. Now is the they're closer than ever. We're at ninety percent budget wise, and um, uh, so yeah, I, I've been here working on development, uh, talent development, and also trying to uh, help the club give a push into the pro league um, for the last four years now. And uh, on so with that, I work as an assistant coach uh, for the Orange Lions. Uh, so you know, keeps keeps me busy. Yeah, it sounds like you're busy. <laughs> Sound busy. It, for those, uh, Orange Lions is the Dutch national team, uh, which is a big deal. Uh, he mentions Worthy De Jong, Mohamed Karazi, but pretty much the best, uh, obviously the best Dutch players that we have uh, play play for mm. that team. But Nijmegen used to be uh, Matrix, and, and yeah. for those for our Dutch listeners, everybody knows Matrix Story Club. Uh, Teddy played against them multiple years, obviously. Me and Matt did too, but always had good teams. So I'm actually hoping. I think it's great for the league if you bring that fan base back into it. In my opinion, because I always remember playing down there, their fans were were they were. I mean, if you played for them, they'd be fun. But like for the for the opponent, you know, they was crazy loud. Um, it was a tough place to play all the time. So I, I hope I hope you guys get back in the league and, and, and make some noise and do it. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because a lot of people say the same thing. They said it was one of the hardest places in Holland to play. For sure. And, uh, there's still uh, a lot of that community is still involved. And that's part of the reason I came because there is a basketball history and culture here to build off of. And that's kind of where we're at now, taking that final step uh, to getting it back to where it used to be. Uh, so it's uh, it's been it's been a journey. And hopefully, you know, we're at the we're at the finish line. Uh, um, come next coming next month actually so uh, we will see yeah that would be great I mean the more teams the better I mean especially what's going on now mm -hmm. you know a lot of a lot of teams kind of lost out from the COVID and the situation was going on so it'll be good to be able to pull another team back up in the league it'd be great actually so would you guys be the the matrix again or what would the what would the yeah. club name be um no it's uh the dreamfield dolphins that's the uh the club is patawa and now they've started a basketball community held uh with all the clubs in the region to work together towards dbl so there's multiple board members from all of the communities right uh but the but the, the team name would be Dreamfield Dolphins, and that's the promo club that they have here. Um, so that's because uh, the one of the sponsors is the owner of Dreamfields, and the Dreamfields owner is actually the the Magic's owner or the Matrix owner. Uh, it was a nightclub, and now yeah, sure. he got into uh, uh, festivals. He's uh, it's Dreamfields. Right. <laughs> Man, I, I I went to the Matrix Club one time. That was one of the craziest experiences I ever had. <laughs> It was, like a big, it was like a big old techno club with like lights flashing on the stage. And, well, man, I tell you what, that's was, that's also one that's also one of the reasons it was hard to play at Matrix Magics because the club owner, his name is David Bronze, 
he put on the um, the entertainment for for the games. You know, so they had it, it was a club owner putting on the entertainment for the game. So they had the DJ, the lights. It was the, lit there. Yeah. <laughs> it was lit in the games, and it was lit at that club too. It was just it was the club was like another level of it. Like, I was, <laughs> yeah, I, it was my first time experiencing something like that. So. Yeah, I'll never forget going in there, but that's what's up, man. I'm, I hope uh, I hope you guys get in because I was Den Haag. Den Haag is trying to come in too. Yeah, been dropped out. Uh, so we need. Yeah, I hope I hope you guys come in, man. So the next question would be: Is are you guys expecting to be competitive your first year? Is this sort of a thing like you want to develop young talent, or like what, how are you guys approaching that? Um, well, I'm always expected to be competitive, uh, but uh, of course there there might be restrictions in in uh, budget the first year, so that that's going to be a challenge to be competitive with a smaller budget. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I don't I don't I don't see it that way. Um, I think that we could do a lot with a little if we get the right mindsets together. Um, right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, young and hungry players. Um, so, uh, uh, but you know, it, it all depends um, uh, how far our budget could reach, you know, what kind of team we can put on the floor. And we're not, we don't know that yet uh, because there's, yeah. there are several sponsors and now there's the discussion of what the, what the sponsors are going to put in what the budget's going to be, you know, what are the costs. And I'm not really involved in that conversation, um, but yeah. I, I, you know, um, I believe that we will compete on any level um, with whatever budget, and that's uh, maybe that's reason for the sky. But uh, I like it. Shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't be. shouldn't be no other way. I like that mindset, man. Like <laughs> right. That, man. And obviously, <laughs> with the whole budget thing, you don't know. Like COVID, that's affecting a lot of stuff throughout Europe right now. So, man, I hope. Uh, I hope y'all. I hope y'all get it together and get in the league, man. Because I can't wait to. I can't wait to see. I think well, also good. Also, I mean, you know, I'm I'm now working for the national team, so I'm I'm in charge of uh, talent recruitment in in Holland, and there used to be a lot of talents coming from Gelderland. <coughs> Gelderland is the region that I live in. That the, it's Nijmegen is in Gelderland, and um, there's a lot of big talents from from this region. You know, Yito Kock, Shane Hammock, um, but Hang they on. they they were bred through that matrix time. You know, so yeah. with a DBL team installed here, we we might be able to breed more players from this region. You know, right. we miss the wow factor if if yeah. you want to get young players involved. Uh, so that's also you know part of part of my ambition to bring basketball, uh, and and you know the the board's ambition to bring basketball to this region is so we can develop more talent. And as an as an Orange Lions coach, uh, it, it just adds extra uh, kick to what I'm trying to do. I yeah. like it. I like it, man. I think I think that's one of the the, the biggest things in Holland right now is uh, that maybe I'm not gonna say missing, but mm -hmm. they need more of is developing the young talent. So if that's a goal of the club, I think I think that's a win for everybody, man. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mo, Matt. Sorry, everybody. I call him Mo because that's what I called him back in the day. My yeah, we had we had three mats. We had three mats on the team: Voucher, Hype, and Mo. Yeah, and I was yeah. Mo. So I always call Mo. And I I always slip up and do that. But Matt, <laughs> I want I, I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming, Matt. With no, your, thanks for having me. I mean, like I said, I always looked up to both of you guys as as players. And lucky enough, I was on the court with you. And at one time, I was even on the court with Teddy. And you know, I followed your career. It's a it's a it's a pleasure to talk with you guys. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, man. Appreciate, appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, fellas. Well, to the next episode, ladies and gentlemen. We'll holler at you. Later.